Hello and welcome to ICT for Education's interview series covering hot topics for uh, schools in the primary and secondary sector. My name is Sarah Underwood. I'm the editor at ICT for Education. Today I'd like to welcome Pete Collison, Head of Formative Assessment and School Platforms Technology at RM. Pete, please tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, we'll talk about assessment. Yeah, super. Well, thank, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for having me uh, come along today. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, so, so as you say, I'm Head of Formative Assessment at, uh, at RM Education. Um, I've been really proud to, to have worked for RM for the best part of 20 years now, and, and pretty much all of my career has been focused um, in and around the education space and, and helping schools, colleges, universities um, really embrace technology um, for, for the benefit of, of improving pupil outcomes and, and quality of education. So um, really excited to talk to you today. It'd be good to get into some interesting topics around assessment. Great, fantastic. So we are going to talk about assessment and here is your first question. Mm -hmm. What impact has COVID had on the assessment landscape? Yeah, it's, a, it's pretty profound, I think, in, in a fair few places, um, a, a, as it has been on so many landscapes globally. Um, I think I'd probably break it down into three sort of categories of, of impact, really. Um, the first and probably the most sort of publicly visible impact is, is that of sort of school level high stakes summative assessments so at A levels and GCSEs. Um, you know, pretty much all of us will have been aware of what happened in summer 20 when those exams were cancelled at reasonably short notice. Uh, alternative arrangements had to be put in place and computer algorithms did or didn't do a particularly good job of some of that and, and you know long long debated and one not to delve into too much today but but, but that was a very obviously a public um, impact of that and I think um, you know this summer will, will equally be affected again we know that the majority if not all exams are, are being cancelled um, there are some significant differences this time around though so, so, so there's very good reason to have confidence in, in, in the system going forward uh, which is great um, and interestingly, RM has recently uh, done some research uh, specifically around this, it's due to, to be published soon, uh, which shows that certainly from a secondary school teacher perspective, there's really high levels of confidence of, in the system going into summer 20, that, that the alternative arrangements will be suitable. Um, some sort of nearly 80% of teachers reporting that they were, they were very confident in the, the alternative arrangements. By contrast, however, um, just 5% of exam board contacts that we asked said that they were very confident in the system going forward. Um, we should note um, that the sample size for exam boards was quite small. Um, and we should also note that these questions were being posed in February when some of the detail was still being worked out. But nevertheless, um, that there's clearly quite a lot of discussion to be had there and big differences in, in confidence. So, so I think that, that's definitely an area that has impacted, will continue to impact and has got some distance to travel. The, the second area, probably less visible, um, but a lot of really great stuff is happening is in the university space. Um, so, so there's been a lot in the press about students returning to campus or not returning to campus, value for money of tuition fees not really much around assessment actually. The universities have just kind of got on with it um, and broadly have done, done a pretty good job I think. Um, they've done some really interesting things within their sector like um, you sort of en masse embracing open book exams, you know, complete changes to their assessment process away from closed hall uh, sort of invigilated exams to, through to something much more open and much more flexible. Um, and pedagogically, that, that's a really big step forward. Um, and we're, we're hearing lots of positive things from, from both the candidates and, and the, the lecturers and educators about that. Um, so, so definitely some nuggets in there around HE, which maybe we'll come back to as we, as we talk further. The, the third area, which I think is the area that's, that's been sort of put on the back burner. I don't think it's been forgotten about, but, but I think it has been put down the priority list. Um, it is that of formative assessment. So that sort of informal, regular, frequent assessment of pupils learning as they're going through a learning journey. Um, when lockdowns first started to happen, schools and colleges and universities quite rightly focused all of their efforts on how do we ensure the continuation of learning. You know, quite right, quite understandable, exactly the right thing to do. Less thought was put into how do we assess that learning? How do we assess the gaps that may exist when pupils return to school, et cetera? So I, I think that's the area that probably now needs a bit of focus as we, as we go forward and, and perhaps hasn't had quite the visibility of some of the other examples that I talked about. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you. And so are these changes for the better and will they last? You mentioned um, higher education sector. Will some of that, do you think, uh, filter down into the secondary sector? Um, how, how do you see that panning out? Yeah, I, I, think, I think definitely some of them will last. And, I mean, and some of the changes um, have been better than others. So, so I think the good changes are here to stay. Um, the ones that were perhaps reactive changes or, or were to, to solve an immediate solution, but perhaps were not not ideal. I think they will they will inevitably fall away, and the system will improve. But I, I do think we've come too far now to ever fully go back to the old way of doing things, the old normal, if you will. Um, and indeed, I mean, just yesterday, um, the All Party Parliamentary Group for Education Technology published its first report, looking specifically at lessons from lockdown. Um, and that report makes a raft of really interesting and in some cases challenging recommendations to, to government, to the Department of Education and the education system generally about stuff that should quite rightly be here to stay you know and, and there's some you know, many examples I could call out but, but you know something that really struck me was the progress we've made in ensuring that, that disadvantaged pupils can engage in education through digital technology. Uh, pupils that might find it hard to physically attend school for all manner of reasons but may be able to engage digitally and remotely much more easily. You know, some fantastic stuff that's, that's been done there and that absolutely should be, should be here to stay. Um, from an assessment point of view specifically, um, I, I think there's a couple of good examples there. If we remember that assessment systems by and large should, should exist on, on a few core principles around fairness, accessibility and trust, um, then I think if we keep those in mind, this idea of open book exams I think becomes quite appealing um, because you're changing what you're assessing, oversimplifying here, but these exams should be more, more Google proof. Um, you know, it moves us away from, from essay mills and all these things that, that get a lot of public attention um, at the moment. Um, it, it's also a much more authentic assessment experience. You know, students don't like spending three hours in a school sports hall sat at a desk with a piece of paper in front of them and, and a calculator and nothing else you know that's that, that's an alien environment to all of the rest of the learning experiences they have so i think anything that moves us away from that model is 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 to be applauded and, and we should look carefully at um, i think the second thing that, that definitely should should be here to stay is just in general, the adoption of digital assessment technologies. So, so digitizing the entire exam process, not just bits of the, the workflow, um, but simply because that, that just generates so much interesting and valuable data and, and is such a more efficient way of doing things. I think that that will be a lasting legacy of, of this and will flow down into schools. You know, it, it's not happening in huge volumes in that sector at the moment, but, but I think it should. Okay, so look, looking at uh, the school situation sort of in the digital world, uh, they should perhaps um, be looking more at tech for assessment and how could they do that? How could they approach that? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a good question. I, th I think they should, as, as I mentioned a moment ago. So th there is a lot of growing evidence now that, that digital assessment systems and platforms aren't, aren't just the reserve anymore of high stakes endpoint assessments that get delivered by exam boards. Um, RM is working on a couple of projects around this, one with, a, with an examination board in Australia, um, who are using our platform to deploy formative assessments into the classroom. Uh, not, not to award final certifications, but to help and support teachers understand where they're where their class is at, where their learners are at, what do they know, what do they, what don't they know, um, to make those sort of on the fly adjustments to their teaching as they go. So, so that's a really interesting uh, example. And I think we will see more and more of that, sort of those use of that real high strength technology mm. in a far less formal environment. So, uh, so, so I think we'll see that. Um, we will also see, I think, some more innovative uses of, of assessment come out. Something else that, that I'm working on quite a lot at the moment, um, is the concept of comparative judgment uh, as an assessment methodology. Um, it, it's, it's an alternative to, tra to traditional marking, um, lends itself particularly well to assessing uh, uh, work that is subjective in nature, creative work. So uh, creative writing and art and design and drama, music, dance, all of those things where there's no definitive right or wrong. Um, so we're seeing some really interesting innovation and, and new approaches come out there. Um, and 
taking a digital approach to them just makes it so much more efficient to roll out and deploy and to access both in school and at home. So I think you yeah. know, we, will, we will still have that blended world of learning. You know, learning doesn't just happen within the school physical building anymore. You know, the school is, is now a digital entity. Um, so I think we will see a lot more of that going forward. And, 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 and rightly so. I think that's all for the benefit of the learner, that they're, they're good, ex good assessment experiences to engage with. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think, as you said earlier, that's certainly a, a result of the pandemic, just uh, widening the learning area for children from home and school and for teachers. Um, talking about the tech, though, let's uh, go to the extreme or the extreme as we know it at the moment and talk a little bit about AI and automation of assessment. I think some people feel very comfortable with this and some people may not <laughs> feel very comfortable with this. What's the effect there sort of for the, for the students, the teachers, the outcomes? Obviously, the AI has to be explainable. Um, what are people thinking there? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? So let's, <coughs> I think it's important to make a distinction between, between automation and, and AI. Mm -hmm. They do often get lumped together, but they are, they are quite different things. So if we think about automation first, that, that's probably, I guess, the slightly less controversial um, end of things. Um, so, so in this case, automation in the assessment world is, it, it exists, the, the technology is there, um, it, it's been around for a while. And, and what it would typically look like is using technology to automate workflow. So, so automatically assigning assignments to a class of pupils based upon data in the school management system. So automating sort of the admin processes of setting an assignment, gathering marks and, and handling that. that. That's all great, that's fine. I don't think anybody would, would, would argue that that's not a good thing. Um, it's also entirely possible to automatically create assessment content now. Um, some subjects, it lends itself to better than others. M maths is a good example, uh, where if you set the parameters of a particular question, that then you know, the system can automatically fiddle with the variables to make many different versions of that same question. So you know, creating assessment material in some cases can be, can be automated. And I don't, don't think that's an overly controversial piece. It is also possible, and, and it happens quite a lot, to automate some of the marking uh, of, of assessment. And the, the most obvious example is multiple choice questions, yes. where you know, there, there is a right answer and a collection of wrong answers. You can automate the marking of that. that that's dead, dead simple. And actually now we're also starting to see the automatic generation of feedback against that. So, th for example, through clever assessment design, it's now increasingly common that if, if you have a multiple choice question, you'll have a correct answer. And some of the incorrect answers will be designed to flush out common misunderstandings. So they won't just be random wrong answers, that they'll be really intelligently selected answers. And, and attached to that can be some feedback that says to the student, well, if you selected this answer, we, we're pretty sure that you've got this misunderstanding. So here's some feedback to help you address that. So automating that, I think, you know, it, it is possible. It's not suitable in all subjects, but it can get there and it can happen. And I think all of that is good. And, and we'll, we'll see more of that because it, it, it's efficient. It's a good way of doing things and it's still unique to the user. A AI is a slightly trickier, uh, a trickier argument here. Um, I think we need to be careful that a lot of people use the phrase inappropriately when, when they talk about AI, when that's not really what they're talking about. Um, in assessment, I think there are some good examples of where our AI can make a difference. So, the most obvious of which is, is adaptive testing. So this is where uh, an assessment will call upon a large bank of questions and the system will choose which question to call for a particular candidate based upon their previous answers. So if I got a whole bunch of questions correct and I was performing well, the system might choose slightly harder questions for me. So, so that, that's good because it, the assessment now becomes personal to me. Uh, and if, if I am particularly good at the subject, I get challenged to, to progress my knowledge further. Similarly, if I'm less able with the subject, the system can dial back so that I'm not receiving questions that I just can't answer. And, and therefore I'm getting stressed and demotivated and all of these things. So I think you know, you, you're, where we do see AI having a place, it's in that in that sort of personalization piece. You know, we, nobody with assessment wants to be in a scenario where the computer says no, and therefore someone's, you know, someone's end result, their grade, their chances of progression to further education are hampered because of a computer saying no. 
we don't rm never wants to be in that place i don't think that's a good place to be but i think we can do some really clever stuff around personalizing the feel of assessment and, and ai has definitely got a role a role to play there and of course both of these things add up to freeing up the teacher and freeing up their time to ultimately build stronger connections with their students and, and that's really what this is all about it's not there to in any way detract from that quite the contrary you know education is great is at its best when the link between the educator and the learner is strong and assessment should support that right. and you're working on ai in this case machine learning i guess um yep. and it, have you worked with schools on it is that uh, beginning yeah. to go through we, we certainly have, yeah. I mean, I, I gave you a couple of examples earlier of, of some things we're doing in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so that platform is, is an adaptive testing platform. So that, right. that platform okay. will, will use that kind of methodology. Um, and actually the example I gave earlier about comparative judgment, um, the platform right. that RM uses for that also uses some AI in the background to intelligently choose which pieces of work get presented for evaluation so that teachers aren't wasting their time um, but but also you're getting to high levels of reliability as quickly as possible so so definitely we're starting to see that play in now i think it needs to be done in quite a controlled manner you know it's a bit like self-driving cars isn't it you know we make <laughs> we make steps of progress yeah but no one i don't think is quite yet ready to fully take their hands off their wheel and fall yeah. asleep in the back you know sure, whether, sure. whether it's right that we get to that stage in assessment yeah you know, whether it's right that assessment never get seen by a human personally i'm not no. comfortable with that uh, but that my view maybe not the view of others <laughs> that's interesting i would guess it's a human in the loop kind of uh, thing yes. ultimately because we are talking only about people at the end of the day yeah, yeah i think you're right it's an argument it's an augmentation proposition i think that is the most powerful yeah. one and the most effective one yeah that's really interesting so this in a great part peter's been a sort of a, a COVID has been the catalyst for some of this development and thinking. Yeah, yeah, it really has. Uh, and I think it has really enabled conversations to be had that, that were being had before, but there were lots of, there were lots of good, ex good excuses, we'll use that term probably in an ill advisedly, lots of good reasons why change didn't happen. There was always a good reason to do it. Well, we'll do it next term or we'll do it next term or we'll do it the next academic year. Um, and, and you know that really has changed you know COVID has come along and prompted such a huge amount of change um, you know we do need to be mindful that, that teachers and educators and school leaders are fatigued at the mm -hmm. moment you know that they are you know like like NHS and, and lots of other sectors you know they're, they're really knackered they, they've worked incredibly hard to get to where we've got to um, and companies who provide to, to them RM included you know need to be really sympathetic to that um, but I think now that we've been through this change, let's not lose that momentum, I think, going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Pete. Thank you for joining us this morning to talk about assessment. There's um, clearly a lot going on. If people want to catch up with some of the uh, things you've talked about, where can they find you? Yeah, well, a couple of good places. So, so rm.com uh, is a good place to start. Um, on there, you'll find all of the various uh, RM sort of services and solutions and case studies and things that we're doing internationally. Um, you're also very welcome to follow me on Twitter um, at RM Peter Collison. Um, follow me and, and I'll be tweeting out on stuff that we're doing, mainly around assessment and other bits and bobs. So it would, uh, would be great to, uh, to, to link up with anyone that's interested. Thanks very much indeed, Pete. Thank you for listening, everybody. If you've got ideas you'd like us to talk about in one of our forthcoming conversations, do let us know. Meantime, uh, good luck. I hope the teaching goes very well. And thanks, Pete. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank